Okay, so we are going to go ahead and start the air pollution notes part two. Uh, this is mostly just about indoor air pollution. Um, so we'll start, we should be right in the middle of your note packet where it says part eight, indoor air pollution. Um, so we're going to go through and list some of the main indoor air pollutions, where they come from, and what the fixes for those are. So it says there are uh, levels of 11 common pollutants that are generally two to five times higher inside homes and inside buildings and outdoors. Um, a lot, or partially due to, inadequate ventilation. So we'll, we'll talk about that a lot. A lot, of, a lot of these issues stem from the fact that uh, you don't have circulating air, you don't have outside air coming inside, the indoor area becomes very stagnant. Um, it says there are health risks to indoor air pollution because people spend 70 to 98 percent of their time indoors, especially these days. Um, some of the biggest indoor air pollutant risks are smoking and burning wood to heat homes. Um, the burning the wood to heat homes is definitely more of an issue like in a developing country but you know some people still do that here as well um, there's a source of cancer risk and um, greatest risk people for indoor air pollution would be smokers uh, infants and children under five um, the elderly the sick pregnant women people with respiratory or heart problems to begin with um, factory workers and uh, pollutants can cause dizziness, headaches, coughing, sneezing, nausea, burning eyes, and chronic fatigue, uh, and then even more issues than that. All right, this picture, we're not going to go through all of this, but this just kind of gives you an idea of all of the different areas and parts of your house that could be contributing uh, indoor air pollution um, to your home, to your health. Um, we have things coming from your kitchen, from your bathroom, uh, under your house, in the basement, that's a big one, we'll get to that, from your carpets, from your textiles, from your fire, um, all over the place. Okay, so one of the first things we'll talk about is uh, something that's called sick building syndrome, and this is a syndrome that produces flu-like symptoms uh, from indoor pollution. Um, you would know that you're in a sick building uh, when at least 20% of the occupants suffer persistent symptoms uh, that stop when they go outside or they start working in a new building, they're no longer in that same building, um, or they're, and they're, people who are in this particular building are more commonly sick because of reduced air exchange and chemicals from the building materials. Um, they say sick building syndrome costs uh, companies $100 billion um, per year in absenteeism because people are sick so they can't come to work, uh, reduce productivity from being sick, and then other health costs that come from that. Um, it could be caused by uh, certain mineral fibers in building materials in their building, uh, fiberglass, formaldehyde, which is an extremely irritating gas that can come from all sorts of different sources, uh, molds, and even pollens, especially molds if it's an old building. Um, also, burning of wood, dung, crop residues, and open fires, and again, this is mostly in developing countries. Um, those could also be responsible for respiratory illnesses, um, you know, within a, if they're inside of a structure. Okay, so here you have, again, pointing out all sorts of different aspects of your home that could be given off, um, chemicals, fibers, irritants, stuff that you might not be aware of. Um, and here you have tobacco smoke, obviously, so that's a big one. It could be chemicals coming from your flooring that, you're, that you've bought, from your paint that you've painted the walls with, uh, from new furniture that you've bought, um, stuff beneath your flooring. So again, this picture points out this the same type thing. And then this is that lovely mold. And so, uh, you know, like I said, a lot of times an older house or a house that's uh, undergone some flooding or any sort of water plumbing issues, it can accumulate mold. Uh, sometimes families, like everybody in the family will become sick. So I've even seen cases where people have died from the mold that's growing in their house. So mold can be a very scary uh, pollutant within your house. Okay, asbestos. You've probably heard lots of commercials about asbestos. So uh, what this is, it says it's several different fibrous forms of silicate minerals that have been widely used since the 40s. They were used in fireproofing and insulation, keeping the building warm. 
um, used to be used. It's no longer used. So it says, if breathed, uh, these little particles, this is what they look like down here um, when they're magnified, little fibers. If these little fibers are breathed in, they can remain in your lungs for years. Um, as we said, they were commonly used in building stuff, in fireproofing, soundproofing, insulation, um, brake linings. Uh, so all of these things can produce what's caused, uh, or what's called asbestosis, which is a chronic, sometimes fatal disease that eventually makes breathing nearly impossible. Uh, it can also cause a type of cancer called mesothelioma. That's the commercial I always see on TV. Uh, mesothelioma is always caused by asbestos particles accumulating in your lungs. Um, and again, that, that uh, ends up creating this uh, inoperable cancer of your chest and your lungs. Um, let's see, those who are affected, asbestos miners, uh, insulators, pipe fitters, shipyard employees, workers in asbestos producing factories, um, those are all people who have experienced this mesothelioma from asbestos. Um, and it says most asbestos factories have gone out of business or moved to other countries because it was phased out of use uh, by our country, uh, by the EPA, in 1997. So that's what it looks like. Okay, uh, radon. Radon is an interesting one, and it actually um, kind of is going to go along with uranium that we'll talk about with our... Uh, uh, energy unit coming up soon. So radon is a colorless, odorless, tasteless, naturally occurring radioactive gas. It's produced by the decay of uranium, which is a uh, mineral found underground that we use for nuclear power. Um, it says it can accumulate in buildings with basements and buildings with slab foundations. And I'll show you some pictures to kind of show you how it would get into your house. Um, if radon is inhaled, um, it can expose lung tissue to large amounts of radiation which can, excuse me, sorry, uh, which can lead to, um, supposed to be lung cancer, <laughs> oops, uh, which can lead to lung cancer, and it says it's actually the leading cause of lung cancer in non-smokers. Um, I used to always wonder, how do these non-smokers get uh, lung cancer? Apparently this is the leading, leading cause. Um, it says lifetime exposure in a home can be responsible for uh, almost 14,000 deaths a year from radon poisoning. Um, what are your solutions to radon creeping into your house? Um, one is to increase ventilation to seal off any cracks around your plumbing, your sewage, and your gas connections in your basement. So let me, I need to show you a picture of how it would get into your house and you can see why. Ventilating and most importantly like sealing off any cracks so that the radon can't seep into your basement uh, is very important. Okay, so here you have your house and your basement. Here you have this house that's sitting on top of bedrock where you would have uranium down here in your bedrock and it's showing here that the bedrock has been fractured. Um, the radon is released from the uranium so it's showing you here your radon can actually um, move up through the bedrock into your soil. It can move up to the bedrock and get into your um, water, into your well, which would then get pumped into your house and then into your shower. Um, the radon could get into your groundwater in the same way, and again, that comes in through your, your sump pump. Um, it can get into this bedrock surrounding your house, and it would get in through cracks in your basement, it would get in through window, uh, it will seep into mostly basements through the bedrock that would contain your uh, radon, Ra uranium, sorry. And this map shows us where in the U.S. we mostly find heavy radon. And so again, the bright red is going to be heaviest and the uh, grayer shades would be lower. It looks like we're pretty good in Virginia. Looks like we've got a little bit out here, um, kind of bordering West Virginia. Um, so really, wherever we see uranium, and again, this will tie into our nuclear stuff next chapter. So it looks like we've actually got a lot up here in uh, Pennsylvania and then most of it out here in the Midwest. Oh, in Mimal. Got a lot in Mimal. Okay, just a couple more pictures showing you this. So again, this is these little things are representing a uh, radon decay from uranium. So if you had cracks in your floor, um, if you have these open windows that are near this cracked bedrock where you have the radon coming up, it could come through that. Um, 
Here they're all showing you all the appliances that could kind of help to kind of pick it up. So again, it's coming in through through the ground and then through your basement. Okay, formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is going to come from materials in your house, uh, like plywood, press board, textiles, so certain fabrics and materials, um, furniture stuffing in your couches and chairs, and carpets. That's the one I hear a lot about is uh, chemicals and carpets. Um, health effects of breathing in and being around formaldehyde would include dizziness, rashes, breathing problems, headaches, and nausea. Um, best solution for formaldehyde is to purchase items that don't contain formaldehyde. Um, and so you'd have to just do research before you get new carpet or before you get a new couch to make sure that they're using um, materials that don't have formaldehyde in them. Um, also, of course, increasing ventilation. That seems to be a theme with a lot of these. Okay, how is human health harmed by air pollutants? Um, lung cancer, we've heard that for a couple of these so far. Asthma. Okay, um, it says it's typically an allergic reaction um, causing episodes of shortness of breath. Okay, it can give you chronic bronchitis, which they describe as persistent inflammation and damage to cells lining your bronchi and bronchioles. It uh, can cause mucus to build up. It can then cause really painful coughing and shortness of breath. Uh, emphysema is bad. It's irreversible damage to your air sacs, which are those little grape-like looking things, the alveoli. Um, in your lungs, okay, you can lose lung elasticity, you get shortness of breath, uh, and then it says carbon monoxide reduces the ability of blood to carry oxygen, which impairs perception, um, causes headaches, dizziness, nausea, and can tr trigger heart attacks and damage the fetus. So, a lot of bad um, effects from pollutants. And then here's just a picture of healthy lung tissue and bad lung tissue. Okay, how many people die prematurely from air pollution each year? So outdoor is 65,000 to 200,000. Um, and then total pollution death overall is 150 to 350,000 per year. Okay, here we can see some little pie charts. Oop, let me see if I can get this guy out of the way real quick. Uh, outdoor exposure. Um, so in a developing country, which again we said like they're still burning a lot of uh, biomass, like woods and dung and stuff, even indoors. Um, well, this is not indoors. This is outdoors. But uh, and and they are using the coals and they're using the dirtier burning fuels. Um, we can see that we have a lot higher deaths in outdoor um, pollution than we do in developing country. Or sorry. We have a lot more. We have a lot higher deaths in developing countries for outdoor pollutants than we do for developed countries. Okay, 93% versus 7%. Uh, for indoor exposure, let's see. We have uh, developing countries are still ahead with 67%, uh, um, and that's in a rural area. So again, think burning of the fire and the dung inside of the building. Uh, it says more in an urban area where it's more of a city type place, uh, 23%. And then your developed only makes up 10% here. So, uh, and then more in urban for a developed country and then less in a rural. So it's actually opposite for the developed country. The developing has higher in rural uh, for indoor and lower in urban. Developed countries have higher in urban, lower in rural. And again, we can probably make the connection is because cities in a developing country are going to have more pollutants than a rural area um, in a developed country. Okay, so what are some management strategies? Uh, a lot of these kind of repeat themselves, so I'll go through them kind of quickly. Uh, obviously, if we can reduce fossil fuel combustion, that would alleviate a lot of the pollutants we've talked about, um, not only in these notes, but especially in our, in our previous notes, the outdoor pollutants. Um, reduce demand for electricity and private cars to begin with. Um, if we can get people to carpool or take public transport, uh, turn off lights in their house, um, unplug electronics when we're not using them, that's going to cut down on how, how much uh, fossil fuel and how much energy we're using. Uh, switching to renewable energy strategies, and we'll talk a lot more specifically about this in a few weeks. Uh, catalytic converter is something that we have on our cars now. This is what it looks like. Uh, it's underneath of your car. 
I believe that it was uh, it was passed in the law back in the 70s. Uh, you have to have it now. And what they do is they really or they reduce. Um, from the emissions coming out of your car, they reduce carbon monoxide, they reduce uh, VOCs, a lot of those NOs that are coming out, and that's going to help to make the uh, emissions coming out of your car cleaner, less smoggy, and it's also going to help to reduce uh, acid precipitation as well because of the pollutants that it catches onto. Okay, so it's basically like a little cleaner for your car emissions. Everybody has it in our country. Uh, we do have a law that's called the Clean Air Act. It was enacted in 1990. Uh, there are several parts to it. Um, we defined air quality and emission limitations. So companies, industries, they have limits to the types of things they can release. Uh, there's a whole ozone protection part to it. And again, that'll actually be some of our next notes. Uh, there is a whole motor vehicle emissions part to it. Uh, what sorts of emissions can be given off from cars and what's the limit? Uh, same thing for aircraft. Um, there's a clean fuel aspect to it where they talk about um, vehicles and them running on clean fuel and trying to make progress in that realm. And then, of course, controlling acid deposition as well. Okay, and we'll be talking more. You guys are actually going to do a web quest on that, I believe. Okay, so how have laws been used to reduce air pollution in the U.S.? So Clean Air Act, um, we see updates throughout several different time spans recently. Um, so again, federal law, it says federal regulations enforced by each state. Uh, they require standards set for seven outdoor pollutants that specify a maximum level average over a specific period for a certain pollutant prevention of significant deterioration. Um, and then we have national emission standards for certain uh, very toxic air pollutants. And again, there's multiple parts to it. You guys are going to learn a lot more about that on your own. How could U.S. air pollution laws be improved? This first one is huge, 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 huge. Not just in air pollution stuff, but in all this pollution stuff that we're going to be talking about in the next few months. Uh, when we focus on um, cleaning up our environment, we really, really, really need to rely on the preventative piece. We need to rely on preventing the behaviors and the actions before they happen rather than doing the cleanup afterward. Because um, doing the cleanup afterward is expensive and it's temporary and it doesn't really make a difference. We need to work on changing the behaviors from the beginning. Um, we also need to sharply increase fuel efficiency standards for cars and trucks. Uh, we need to require stricter emission standards for fine particulates. Because um, we've covered some particulates, but they're saying that that's not good enough. Um, we should not give trash uh, incinerators permits, and we should set more strict standards for um, for, incinerator, for any um, trash industry or any other industry that does incineration because it burns very dirty and it's very polluting to the atmosphere. And then, uh, really importantly, we should reduce carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions. <coughs> This is an interesting question. Should we use the marketplace to reduce pollution? Uh, we'll talk a lot more about this when we get to uh, climate change and carbon credits. So this is kind of the same idea as carbon credits. So what, what we're saying here is uh, you would give a, a power plant, you would give them a certain number of pollution credits or rights each year that it's allowed to emit. And here they're saying for sulfur dioxide, most of the time I hear it about carbon dioxide. Uh, so it says if they were to emit less sulfur dioxide than the limit, then they receive more pollution credits. Okay, And then you can actually trade credits with other companies, and it becomes its own little industry where you can you know, be buying and selling pollution credits. Certain companies want to be really green and really energy efficient, and they can cut their, um, they can cut their uh, credits, and they can sell them off to other countries or other companies um, that can't lower it, and they don't care, and they'd rather just buy off the credits. Um, some other ideas here is to get older high polluting vehicles off the road <clears throat> and to create stricter emission laws for lawnmowers, chainsaws, leaf blowers, your little, um, you know, your smaller mechanized equipment that also uses um, gas. Okay, so those are all some ideas and we've seen this before getting older high polluting vehicles off the road. We saw that as soon as Obama came into office with uh, cash for clunkers. 
Okay, so here is uh, some overall ways to prevent air pollution and then some overall ways to uh, do the cleanup afterwards. So we'll talk a lot about this with acid precipitation, but one thing that we're already doing is burning a coal that contains a lower concentration of sulfur. Because uh, we know the sulfur stuff is really bad, it can make the sulfuric acid. Um, or we can actually remove sulfur from coal. Uh, we can convert coal to a liquid or gaseous fuel, which would make it burn cleaner as well. Uh, and we can just find fuels that are less polluting. So use less of that really dirty, polluting coal and find cleaner burning um, energy sources. Some cleanup afterwards, it says disperse emissions above the thermal inversion layer with taller smokestacks. We'll talk more about that with acid precipitation again, but that's an idea, is instead of having a little short smokestack like this, you'd actually build a taller one that would get you above a thermal inversion layer if you had one, or a taller stack that would actually get would blow the um, emissions kind of downwind uh, so that the city doesn't get stuck with all the pollution. Uh, remove pollutants after combustion. Um, through, we'll talk about smokestack scrubbers that can do that, and then tax each unit on pollution produced. How can we reduce indoor air pollution? Um, we could create rooftop greenhouses like this. Um, we could um, utilize what's called a breathing wall, which I don't know a whole lot about, but we will talk about that more in detail in class. But it's a special type of wall that actually allows air from the outside to come in and out instead of just normal walls like what we have that are just kind of create the stagnant air living condition inside. Um, and supposedly they also absorb dirty air and they exhale clean air. Um, so they're supposed to be pretty good for indoor air pollution. Some other strategies for um, pollution, not prevention, but management. Uh, these are get a little bit complicated, and I'll, I have pictures of all of these. We have what's called fluidized bed combustion, and we'll come back and talk about these more in detail with um, energy stuff a little bit later as well. And this is where instead of just burning regular coal, you actually crush the coal with limestone. So you've got this crushed mixture of coal and limestone. And we know that coal has a lot of sulfur in it, so the sulfur and the calcium and the limestone combine. Uh, that's actually the calcium is going to buffer down the acid, and it's going to make your emissions less toxic and less acidic. Okay, so it's making making your pollution less less bad from the beginning. A uh, catalytic converter we already talked about in the car, a lime scrubber. Okay, again, it's something else. It's a it's a spray as the um, sulfuric emissions are coming out of a factory smokestack, you've got this spray of a uh, liming substance, like a limestone, that helps to neutralize the acid as it's coming out. You have a bag filter, and it says this is a series of bags used to catch particulates as they rise and smoke, and the bags are periodically emptied of their ash, so this kind of reminds me of like a vacuum bag. Uh, you have an electrostatic precipitator, which removes 99% of particulates in coal emissions. Uh, what they do is they run the emissions through a series of charge plates um, that have their own little charges to them and that's going to charge the particles as they're coming through these particulates and that's going to cause them to kind of be magnetized and bind to a plate with the opposite charge. So it's like magnetizing the particles and then causing them to stick to a big magnet. So again it's going to clean up your emissions as they come out. And then you have a cyclone collector which again it almost kind of reminds me of a vacuum but kind of opposite. Um, as, as the emissions are going up, it creates a little spinny vortex in the smokestack and that actually kind of disrupts the movement of the particles and that's going to cause the particles to bump into each other and to fall back down so they don't actually get released into the atmosphere. So let's look at some of those pictures. This is that electrostatic precipitator that we said. So here's your emissions coming out of the factory. They're going to go between these little charged plates. The charged plates are going to give them a charge and then they're going to stick um, to certain plates. Okay, and then here you can see some extra dust gets released there. And so the only gas that's being released out this way should be clean. It shouldn't have very many particles in it. Here's the bag house filter, which we said is kind of like a vacuum. Um, dirty gas comes in here, gets collected in bags, uh, so none of that junk goes out into the atmosphere because it's gotten caught in the bags and only clean gas goes out. And here's the cyclone thing. We said the dirty gas comes in, 
Uh, it's moving these particles around in a cyclone type manner. That's going to cause all the particles to bump into each other. So instead of them being released at the top, they collide and they, co they collect at the bottom. Okay, so it's just keeping those extra particulates from getting out. And here's a scrubber. We called it a lime scrubber. They're calling it a wet scrubber here. So your dirty gas would come into here. You've got these little sprayers, these little hoses that are going to be, um, in this case it says clean water, but in the ones that we've talked about, we talked about how they use lime or like a limestone spray, which is going to help to neutralize an acid. So it's going to spray some sort of chemical to clean up that um, emission. And so it shows you the wet gas would come down here that's got all the gunk in it and it'll settle. Only the good, clean stuff is actually able to be released. Okay, and then we just have a few more things to talk about with prevention and cleanup. Uh, this, we're going to talk a lot more about this stuff when we get to climate change. These are just overall ways of people to prevent um, pollution from being released, just to prevent the behaviors. We said that's the best thing to do. Uh, better participation in mass transit, like metro, subway, buses, um, riding bicycles and walking, using less polluting engines, uh, using less polluting fuels, uh, improving your fuel efficiency of the fuel that we do use, um, get older polluting cars off the road, cash for clunkers, um, give buyers tax write-offs for buying low polluting energy efficient vehicles. That's a good one for hybrids. I know they've tried to give some awards to people who buy uh, hybrids already, but yeah, doing a tax write-off is good. Um, restrict driving in polluted areas. And then, again, the cleanup afterwards, if you can't fix these, then at least you can do the cleanup afterwards, even though it's not ideal to just do cleanup. Uh, here it says emission control devices, car exhaust inspections twice a year, uh, and stricter emission standards. Here's some more prevention, and I think these are mostly indoor. Yeah, these are mostly for indoor. Um, this says cover ceiling tiles and lining of AC ducts to prevent release of mineral fibers. We said a lot of these things like asbestos are caused by little fibers that can irritate you. Uh, ban smoking or limit it to well ventilated areas if you are going to allow smoking, which a lot of states have already done that. Uh, set stricter formaldehyde emission standards for carpet, furniture, building materials and prevent radon infiltration. Use office machines in well ventilated areas because office machines can give off a lot of chemicals. Um, use less polluting substitutes for harmful cleaning agents, so that's something you can do in your house. Paints and other products, so when you have your own house or if you help your mom grocery shop, you should, use, you should buy, be buying stuff that does not contain the harsh chemicals because that can irritate you. Um, cleanup or dilution, it says use adjustable fresh air vents for workspaces, keep your air constantly ventilated. Um, increase intake of outside air, open windows, get outside and breathe fresh air. If you're sitting in a stagnant building, that's not good. Um, change air more frequently. So again, get leave your door open, leave your windows open, allow air to circulate through. Um, and this says circulate buildings air through rooftop greenhouses. If your building does have a roo rooftop greenhouse, you would want the air to circulate through to pick up that fresh oxygen from your plants. Um, use exhaust hoods for stoves and appliances burning natural gas. Okay, so yeah, any any stove that you're ever using um, that does have natural gas, you should have one of those hoods over it that can suck the uh, extra gas up. We have one of those, um, and then install efficient chimneys for wood burning stoves because you don't want the wood, um, you don't want the particulates coming into your house. How can we protect the atmosphere? Again, we've seen a lot of this stuff already, but just again, emphasis on pollution prevention, improve energy efficiency, reduce the use of fossil fuels, slow population growth, that was uh, a couple chapters ago, integrate air pollution, water pollution, energy, land use, population, economic, and trade policies, so getting into the politics, regulate air quality for an entire region or airshed, phase in full cost pricing, mostly by taxing the production of air pollutants. And what we mean by full full cost pricing is kind of like including those ecosystem services that the ecosystem does for us. We need to make natural resources more expensive so that people aren't building and, you know, creating new stuff on, on uh, untouched environment. Uh, we need to make things more expensive for developers to do. Um, 
distribute cheap and, ef and efficient cook stoves and solar cook stoves in developing countries. Okay, we'll talk more about these solar cook stoves in a couple chapters. And then transfer latest technologies to developing countries as well. So they're not using the coal and the outdated stuff that is causing so much pollution. Okay, so one last piece on uh, developing countries. It says as they go through the demographic transition, they're going to use more fossil fuels because they are trying to get industrialized. Um, and they're usually not subject to any sort of control in their country because their goal is just to get industrialized. They want to catch up to these other industrialized countries. Um, a good example of that is Mexico City. Mexico City is one of the most polluted cities in the world because it's trying to get industrialized as fast as it can, and so it doesn't set any regulations on their um, pollution. And also it says China has no controls on coal burning. China is big on coal. We'll watch a video on that. Um, so they have really high particulate levels of sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, um, and that causes them a real smoggy issue and breathing issues. And that is it.